Hey guys, I have a question for you. How do you spread abundance? This year, Joe and I are spreading even more abundance by giving out insights on money, wealth strategies, and resources in our current newsletter, Creating Abundance in 52 Weeks, that we want to share with you for free. So sign up right now as you're listening to this episode on our website at www.abundantculture.co. That's .co slash newsletter, www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary V, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hey, everybody, it's Joe. Welcome back to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We're so glad to have you back again today. This week, we're going to be talking about a topic that is not only important for entrepreneurs, but I feel like is important for everybody in the world. And that skill is influence. At the end of the day, if you want a job, you have to influence someone. If you want to get a new client, you have to influence them on why they should be your client. And I feel like there's no better person to talk about influence than the person that we're interviewing today. Uh, This person has interviewed everybody you can think of. He's a well-known person in the podcast world, and he's going to be talking to you about how to influence people who have a higher status than you. So maybe you're just some college kid and you want to interview multimillionaires. We're going to talk about how you go about getting those high-profile people on your show, your podcast, whatever it is that you do. So get ready to listen to and learn from our good friend, Travis Chappell. So hi, Travis, and thank you again so much for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We are so, so excited to have you because you've built up this huge brand and you have a lot of great content out there and you know you're you're just awesome really (laughs) (laughs) thank you Uh, but before we get into you know all of what you do and the relationship and networking side of things we have to ask you how like what's that backstory how did you get into business yeah good question first off thank you uh jasmine and joseph for having me i know the um i know the uh process of what it's like to properly screen somebody to come on your show and to share their story with your audience. So I'm honored to, to be on the show with you guys. Um, I, yeah, for me, I, I guess you could really just say I've always just had the entrepreneurial itch. I don't know exactly what that means or how to define it necessarily, except for maybe just, um, you know, the desire to make money combined with the inability to listen to authority <laughs> and, and maybe not even listen to authority as much as like be able to stick into a system that you just kind of feel like doesn't work for you. Um, so, you know, I was the kid in elementary school that brought other stuff to school to sell to the other elementary kids and things. And I, uh, started my first quote unquote business in my, before my senior year of high school with a buddy of mine, we just started, um, landscaping. So I did a lot of manual labor and mowed a ton of lawns and, um, put in a, a lot of grass and like sod jobs and fixed and installed sprinklers and timers and solenoids and valves and all that good stuff. Um, and, uh, that was like my first really, you know, stint into the, to that world, of, really not, not really the business world, but more just the world of making money. You know, at that point, it's not necessarily a business. It's just like, you know, doing manual labor with a friend and getting paid for it. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but, uh, w- with the position we were in, I, uh, my dad was a real estate agent and, uh, he knew he had a couple investor friends that would flip houses and stuff. And so, we would um, uh, submit proposals and bids to some of those flippers to do like, you know, front lawns and things like that. So, um, and then we would actually hire some of the labor. Um, it usually would just be more friends of mine I would just bring in. And, and so it was a cool summer, man. Like we, you know, we didn't, we just kind of worked basically the majority of the summer, but we also weren't, it wasn't like we were hustling 24 seven, you know, like we still, you know, went to the beach and hung out and did regular teenager stuff. Uh, but then we just had money to spend. So that was cool. Um, and I, I 
took that business, went to college, and I was doing the same thing in college for a while. And I just honestly really got burnt out on it because I hated the actual labor part of it. I just liked the money part of it. And, uh, and so as soon as I started trying to figure out other ways that I could make money, I was pretty quick to abandon the landscaping path. Um, so like my sophomore, junior year of high school, a buddy of mine started in door-to-door sales. And I remember looking at his paycheck for the first time and being like, oh, wow, that's like, that's a pretty decent paycheck. And uh, it sounds ridiculous because it was like, it was like an $800 paycheck or something like that. But he had worked 20 hours that week. And in college, you know, like when you're 19, you're looking at a paycheck that's 800 bucks for 20 hours, like 40 bucks an hour. That That's that's pretty solid. You know what I mean? Yeah, and um, and it was flexible because you didn't, you know, you could you could work whenever you needed to as long as you got your production and your hours in. It was fine. And so it was like the perfect kind of a, you know, side hustle job to have in college. So I asked if he could get me an interview and um, got hired at the job the next week. And then it just kind of took off with it, man. I, I, I just uh, started going forward with it and got promoted my first week um, based on production, got promoted again, like a month into it. And then about two months after that, I had my own team. And then about six months after that, we had about 20, 20 people strong um, taking uh, just knocking doors and um, basically selling solar equipment, and uh, that was really my first into that into that type of a world. And so, by the, by, by the time my junior year, I believe it was no no senior year, I think started, um, I was running that team of guys and making pretty decent money. You know, I, I, it wasn't six figures at that point; it was about like fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a week or so, if you like factored in my commissions and different things like that. And so, um, you know, at 19 or 20 living at home, that's a pretty solid situation. You know, I didn't really have many expenses yeah. and I was mainly just going to school full time. Um, and uh, I just really took took to that world and started learning more about sales and started trying to become a better salesperson and um, get better on the doors and things. And uh, then life progressed as it does. I ended up getting married, graduating college. And then uh, we moved away from where we were living at the time, which was in LA County. My wife and I moved up to Fresno, California. And uh, about a month after I moved there, I got recruited into uh, door-to-door alarms. And uh, that's where I spent uh, a solid amount of time. Uh, that was where I first cracked six figures in door-to-door. And then from there, went into uh, water purification, door-to-door sales, which then led me into the podcasting world. So yeah, it's uh, just you know doing the next thing, doing the next thing, trying to figure out how to make a quick buck a little bit faster than the last time. You know, For sure. <laughs> Definitely. So kind of walk us through like uh, how that actually led to the podcasting world, because it sounded like you were just interested in doing anything that made money. And then you saw this door-to-door sales thing and you're like, oh, I kind of like this. And then you abruptly kind of, it sounds like you abruptly kind of went into the podcasting world. How did that transition really come about? Yeah, good question. So I, uh, it was 2015 and it was, it was that, it was, that was the first year that I cracked six figures. And that was a goal of mine, you know, since I started in door to door was like, man, six figures, six figures. Right. And so I was 21, 22 at the time and, uh, broke six figures for the first time ever. And I remember looking, like looking back at the end of that year and, uh, it was a good year. And like I said, with door to door, there's usually two ways to do it. There's summer programs and those, those typically run from like May to September. And those guys go out like 10, 12 hour days. Like they're, they're freaking killers and they'll go out and pull six figures in a summer, um, from knocking doors all day for four months straight. I was, uh, in a year round program. So we knocked year round, uh, and I, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't waste my time and my energy and good pitches at the beginning part of the day because nobody was home. So we, uh, we always waited till little, till people started getting home from work. So we'd go out at like, you know, two to four o'clock ish. And then we'd stay out till about six to eight o'clock ish, depending on if it was summertime or wintertime like how long it stayed light outside. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, 20, 25 hour work weeks and hanging out on the weekends. And uh, my, my boss all, had parties at his house all the time and he would take us places and um, went to the Bahamas with him and, and, and uh, his, his wife and brother and stuff. And so it was just, a, it was like a fun year. You know, I woke up whenever I wanted to, I went to the gym, played video games, and then I went out and knocked some doors. So okay. at the end of the year, yeah, it wasn't bad, right? Make six <laughs> figures doing that. Like I was, I was pretty happy about it. But then when I looked, like looking back, it was fine. But looking into the future is when I started getting scared because I, I realized that I was already 
knocking on the ceiling of where I was at age 22, uh, my first year into the company. I was the second highest paid rep out of like 35 guys of of that entire branch that had been going for six, seven years. Um, and uh, the only guy that had beat me worked twice the amount of hours that I worked. Um, so I was always like a work smarter, not harder kind of a guy. And this dude was just a hustler. Like he, he was not the best salesman that we had. He was just the hardest worker that we had. And so I looked at that and I was like, well, if I worked as hard as he did, I think that my sales ability is a little bit better. So I, I think that I would probably be able to pull more than like, it would just be incrementally more though. Right. It would be like, and maybe I can maybe stretch another 20, 25% on top of what I made in that particular opportunity. And being that at that point at age 22 scared me a lot because I really had like big goals and dreams for my life. And when I looked 10 years into the future, I didn't see door to door as being the vehicle that was going to get me there um, because I was burning out on it really quick. And for some people, it is the vehicle. I have friends that make multi seven figures in door to door. Um, But uh, for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to keep, to keep doing. That's not what I wanted to be my life. And, uh, so at the end of that year, I basically just stopped. I I took, uh, probably like three, four months off where I almost did basically nothing as I'm, I'm a hustler. Right. So like I was always hustling something to make a quick buck here and there, but for the most part, like we cashed in on a real estate deal that we had and uh, my wife was working. So it allowed me to kind of just stay at home for three or four months and just kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Because the way that I had grown up in a super religious type of a context, the only thing that I knew I was going to do when I grew up was going to be a youth pastor. And um, so I had never questioned that in high school and college. That's what I went to college for. That's what I got my degree in and all that stuff. But by the time that I got out, I, uh, I realized that wasn't the path that I wanted to go down. And uh, so when after that year of door to door, after, you know, hitting six figures, I was basically back to square one, almost square zero. Like I felt like a 14 or 15 year old kid that was just kind of sitting there and looking up career opportunities, just figuring out like, like that was the first time in my life where I truly felt like I could do whatever I wanted. You know, I was just like, oh, wow. Like I could, you know, I looked up, I looked up like FBI applications. I looked up, um, I looked up the the fire department, uh, like how difficult it'd be to get on the LA County Fire Department. Um, I looked at so many different career paths because I was, yeah. I felt like I felt like I was finally free to make a decision yeah. at that time. And uh, the difference is, is that I wasn't a 15 year old kid. I was 22 and I had a wife and a mortgage. Um, so it was a little bit different of a situation and I didn't have as much time. I'd try to kind of figure it out a lot sooner. And so um, my back was kind of against the wall and I started diving into personal development for the first time in my life, sort of reading some books, listening to audio books. And I was never that kind of a guy before. I was always like the do it, figure it out kind of a guy, not really like the let me learn about it for six months and then do it type of a guy. So, um, you know, like probably probably combined up to that point in my life, I'd read maybe 10 books total. And that would include all of the books that I was supposed to have read for school and college and things. So <laughs> but that tells you like how little I enjoyed <laughs> that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was a big joke in my family. Like they would always make fun of me for not being a reader. It was my, my sister took the reading jeans and I took the sports jeans is always how it was. Like I played a bunch of sports and she just read books. And that was just kind of how it was, you know? So I, I, yeah. that it was a big deal for me is, is why I bring that up to, it was a big deal for me. Uh, like, like my back was against the wall enough to where I felt like, man, I got to figure this out, which means I'm going to have to start doing the stuff that I don't like doing, which is like reading and learning and getting more knowledge through these external sources that I've never gotten from. And that's when I uh, ran into podcasts uh, for the first time ever, just started like listening to a couple podcasts and buddy of mine recommended this podcast called entrepreneur on fire with John Lee Dumas. And um, that was one of the first shows that I really started binge listening to. And I uh, uh, took his podcast course and just kind of thought about it for a while. I, I felt like I'd always had a pretty strong propensity toward like creative writing almost like not, I, I didn't enjoy it a lot. It was just that in high school and college when I would turn in a paper or, and then I would read like everybody else's papers in my class, I was just like, I feel like this could be so much better, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I was like, amazing at it or anything. I just, I feel like I just had a little bit of an ability to, yeah. to make something sound good. And so I had thought about blogging previously and I was just like, I, I, even though I might have a decent like propensity toward being good at it, I just don't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to sure. do that. So then I ran into podcasting and it was just like, Oh, okay. So this is something that combines something that I'm pretty decent at, which is like being creative or whatever, creating content. Um, but I get to do it through a microphone and it gets to be audio, which, which piqued my interest a lot more than writing did. And so I, I just kind of, after listening to, to John and, and uh, following some of his stuff, I just kind of decided that that was the route that I was going to take. 
Absolutely. So how did you know what you wanted the podcast to be about? Because there, you know, you could have went so many different ways. I mean, you said you wanted to be like a youth pastor. You could have went, you know, like a faith-based podcast or business, sales, anything. That's a good point. Yeah. So it wasn't as strategic as most people would think. Um, I basically was asking myself, okay, I know I want to do a podcast. What do I talk about? Mm -hmm. And I knew from the little bit of research that I had done that I had to find some sort of niche that I had to, I had to find my blue ocean, so to speak. I had to go find an audience um, for myself. And uh, my first thought right off the bat was like, oh, the only thing that I know about in business is sales. So let me just start a sales podcast. And I went into iTunes and looked it up and there was way too many results for <laughs> sales podcasts. And so I was like, you know, that's not going to be a niche or at all. It's going to be really difficult for me to stand out in that noise, especially because I was 23 at the time. You know, I was like, who's going to listen to me? Who wants to listen to the 23 year old kid? Like you got to listen to all these other people, which was a limiting belief. Sure. But um, I think it also taught me a lesson about, about blue ocean and, and, uh, and having sure. the right niche. So I went kind of back to the drawing board and I just asked myself, okay, so if I look at my six figure year as a 22 year old, what, would I attribute that to? And number one was the sales ability. Number two was like, how, okay, but how did I get good at that? And the only answer I kept coming up with was I got around a guy who was doing a half a million dollars a year in door to door sales, who was the owner of that company that I worked for. And I spent as much time with him as I physically could. Whenever he invited me to something, I was there. Whenever there was a party or a dinner or something, I would try to make my way in to, to be invited. Like I wanted, to, I wanted to glean as much knowledge information as I could from somebody like that. And I wasn't about reinventing the wheel. I didn't have to be the guy that came up with the process or um, had my name patented behind it. I, all I knew is that I wanted results. And if that guy had results, all I really had to do was follow exactly what he did and I would get right. results. Mm -hmm. It was a lot. It was very plain and simple to me. And so that's what I thought. I was like, okay, well, networking, networking has got to be a topic that people are interested in hearing about. Um, let me see, you know, and it's something that I want to learn about, learn more about as well. And uh, so let me see if that exists. And I went to iTunes. I thought it was going to pull up as many results as sales did. And it just turns out it didn't. Um, there was it just wasn't anybody that was focused on that one specific topic. Sure, a lot of people talk about it and have episodes and one-offs and things. But mm -hmm. in terms of a show that was dedicated to only talking about that one topic, nothing really existed. So I was like, that's it. That's, that's my promotion. That's, that's cool. really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So what was the... Don't know why our light went off, but what was the experience like the first time you got somebody who was very in influential onto your podcast? Like, what was, I guess, that first episode like? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I got to think back to who that was. Um, I, you know, besides John Lee Dumas, just because I, I, I paid for that one. That was uh, that was my first influential interview, but you know, I paid to be in a mastermind that he put on. And, uh, so I, you know, that one was kind of guaranteed just because I invested the money to be there. Yeah. Um, so one of the first bigger ones that I remember, um, where it was like a cold reach out and it could have easily just been ignored or said no, uh, was with Patrick, but David, do you guys know who that is? Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Okay. So Patrick, but David at the time, he, he had about 3,000 agents working at, uh, at PHP, his, his company at the time. And, uh, and he had like 350,000 YouTube subscribers. So it kind of gives you some context because now he has over 10,000 agents in his company and like one point something million YouTube subscribers. So he's been absolutely crushing it. Um, so it gives you an idea of context of, in terms of the timing of when, when all this went down. Mm -hmm. Um, so I reached out to Pat on a cold message and, uh, basically just said, um, I, I, I knew that he was just on JLD's podcast. Um, so I name dropped John, but then I also name dropped a couple of other people. So this was, um, kind of my angle coincidentally. And oddly enough, I, I grew up in a town called Lancaster, uh, which is in the Antelope Valley, Northern LA County. So, so Southern California, Northern LA County, just a crappy little town, Lancaster, Palmdale, um, but it just so happened that, uh, that was one of, uh, since PHP was started in like Northridge, I think, um, that just so happened to be one of their bigger offices was actually in Palmdale, um, which was, which is odd just cause there's, just not a lot of businesses that move there and there's not a lot of businesses that perform well there, but the leader, uh, Cindy Kobos that, that was out there, she was just crushing it in Lancaster Palmdale. And a guy that I had recruited to sell door-to-door -door alarms out of there was trying to recruit me into 
into PHP and had me meet with Cindy. Um, and then I had a meeting with, with her upline, which is this guy named George Palayo, who is one of the top guys in all of PHP and still is to this day. Wow. And uh, so when I had that meeting with him, it was like a year after all of that went down that I started my podcast. And so I hit up George and, and, I, and I interviewed George on the show. And so when I talked to Pat, I said, hey, I had JLD on there and I've had your boy, George Palayo, who I knew was like his boy, his boy, like, like, um, like George, like George is one of Pat's first recruits in the business, even before, even before when, when PHP didn't exist and they were at the other company they were at. Um, And so, so I I knew that they had a decent connection. So I I, just with a couple, like with, uh, with the John Lee Dumas connection and then with uh, being connected to George and stuff, I was able to finally get to, to get Patrick to say yes, which was a, a big win, but um, it kind of taught me a lesson on almost waiting your turn because a lot of people start a show and they want all the big names immediately. And I kind of regret getting Patrick on that early because I didn't do a good job of the interview, frankly, because I wasn't that good. I, I, I sucked. I was just, I was start, starting out. I was, I was a beginner and uh, here I am interviewing this like expert and uh, you could definitely tell, I think uh, in, if you went back and listened to it, I think you could tell in the, uh, con- it was, there was definitely contrast um, there that existed. And um, I was also having technical issues, which is another beginner thing, you know, like um, I, I lived out in the boonies in the middle of nowhere. So I was on satellite internet and I was working off of like three Verizon hotspots and stuff. And I had never done a video interview before because I, I did all of them on audio to save bandwidth. Um, so Patrick tunes into the 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 call on video because he does all of his on video. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a strong enough interviewer at the time to be like, Hey man, just FYI, I'll do these all audio only because I want to save bandwidth, make sure the audio quality is good for the podcast. That's all I would have had to say, which is what I said. I've said to multiple people, um, after that interview, but like I said, I wasn't strong enough to be able to be like, Hey, this is my show. This is how my show works. I just kind of was like, Oh, this guy's a big name. I don't want to say anything that's controversial at all. I'll just let him do whatever he wants type of a thing. And, uh, so what happened was the uh, the video was too much for the connection that I had, and there was a lag in uh, the in the feedback in the monitor in the feedback monitoring for my audio. So which basically meant that every time I would say something in the mic, I heard myself say it like a half a second after I said it in my own headphones, wow. and I was like, "This is going to be a problem." And uh, so I took one headphone and I put it off on my ear like that so that I could hear myself actually saying it in real time. Uh, yeah. But I had to leave the headphones on because that's how I got his audio and I couldn't take the headphones out completely because then it would just be his audio feeding back into the microphone. So it was just a big situation. So I'm thinking all this stuff while I'm trying to interview him, while I'm an inexperienced interviewer. And so uh, it, it taught me a big lesson about like, you know, sometimes you're just not ready to do stuff like that. You just got to be willing to put some reps in and get really good at it so that when you do get those opportunities, you can fully take advantage of them. And now luckily, Luckily, Pat's a cool guy, and I ended up um, ended up going out about a year after that interview and doing one in person at his studio in Dallas, and um, I've been able to connect with him a few times since. So he's always been a gracious dude. But uh, but yeah, that that was that was the first big one that uh, that said yes, other than the ones that I had paid for, and, and I, I totally messed it up. So <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> that's such an awesome story, though, because you don't hear a lot about you know people's like failures, like when things go wrong, yeah. um, and just for you to say that you know you weren't ready for that interview, that just shows you know how humble of a person you are. Um, sure. So that was like that was really a great story, and I hope a lot of Thank people you. get to hear that that story. And to piggyback off of a couple good key points that you really brought up, how does somebody actually practice interviewing, or what are some tips that you have for somebody who want to make it kind of like a, a at least a serious hobby, if not a full time living, actually interviewing people because it's it's weird that you don't really think of interviewing as like a skill, but then you do it. And then it's like, holy crap, this guy is on fire <laughs> with interviewing. And then yeah. you, you'll look at your video and you're like, man, I kind of suck. So um, <laughs> how does some, like, what are some tips that you can give to people uh, who interview people, whether it's on a podcast or some other type of platform in order to really get better at their, their craft? Yeah, so it's totally true. Uh, you don't think of it as a skill set. I sure didn't. When I started, I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I took it seriously and I wrote out a ton of questions that I thought were good. But I was like, then it's it's easy once you get in there, you know. Um, but then I remember like the first time where I asked somebody a question and then they answered the question and they stopped. I was like, 
oh, oh, oh shit, I, I got to say something again. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know what I mean? I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a punch to the gut. I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't expect to have to get good at this skill. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's definitely a skill set that you hone after a long time. The number one way is just repetition. Uh, that's why I did, uh, well, that's not why, but, uh, that was a good side effect of the decision to do three interviews a week when I first, uh, started, uh, for the first full year, I was doing three interviews every week. So I released like 150 interviews in my first year of, of starting the podcast. Nice. And, um, that by itself was a lot of repetition and makes you really sit down and, um, and w- when you're getting on back to back to back interviews, you just start Start learning in between and then when you're doing that many in a row you can just start learning from the one that you just did last time and then implementing it immediately instead of like learning something and then waiting three weeks till your next interview to implement it um, so the the, the learn the, the speed at which you learn is significantly higher than doing one a week or uh, something like that so a repetition is number one um, the number two thing that I did personally just because there's not a ton of resources out there on this to be honest um, if you like search how to interview, basically every search result is all about job interviews. It's not about like how do you interview somebody for a podcast or right. a YouTube channel. Like there's really not a lot of resources out there on it. So <clears throat> what what I did is I just found people who I had a lot of respect for as interviewers and I just listened to as much of their content as possible. And sure, I would be listening to the guest for their responses, but the main thing that I'd be listening for is how the interviewer phrased questions, how they talked about certain things, how they acknowledged a a certain part of the conversation, how they brought back a, a topic that they had talked about earlier and did like a callback at the end, um, how they like uh, built a story, a storyline with the individual and didn't get caught off track. And they didn't allow for that person to like bully them into a different conversation if they didn't want to take a conversation that way. Like those types of interviewers, those are the ones that I listened to. And I, I just tried to digest as much of their content as I could and, uh, and implement it into my own uh, strategies. And so, um, and, and, and a lot of times when you listen, like what you, what you put in is what you get out. Yeah. And so if you just like constantly are listening to people like that, you'll just kind of, your brain will start taking over for you. Like when you're in a, if you've prepped a bunch and you're in a situation, your brain will just kind of start naturally giving you the next thing to say without really you like strategically thinking about it just because you know, you've been listening to a bunch of great interviewers and taking notes on what it is that they do that's really, uh, really good. And so I, I listened to a, a good friend of mine now is somebody I started listening to when I first started in podcasting. I'm blessed to have him as, as a close friend of mine is Jordan Harbinger. Um, he's one of the best interviewers that that uh, is in the game, to be honest. And then um, uh, Tim Ferriss is really good. Um, Tom Bilyeu is a really great interviewer. Yeah. There's, there's several, several people like that, that I would, I just was like, man, I, I just got to listen to more of their stuff because they're just brilliant. Yeah, sure. mm-hmm. yeah definitely. So, um, once somebody gets in like all these reps and they think that they're ready to have, you know, like a more influential person on their podcast or, mm-hmm. you know, YouTube channel, whatever it is, um, would you suggest that that person taps into the that person's network because it seems like that's what you did with um I can't think of his name right now I'm having brain fart but <laughs> um Patrick t- yeah t- Patrick. T- <laughs> tap into their network as in like after the interview before the interview no like before the interview how you um got Patrick's uh n- like number one guy on the podcast and then you approached uh Patrick yes. is that how yes it was? Hundred percent, hands down. Yeah, yeah. That's like that, that's the number one way that I've gotten people on my show. Um, if you can, if you can punch people in the face with credibility, you know what I mean. Where it's just like they can't help, like they can't help but say yes, right? Like it's your job as the pitcher to make it as easy as possible for the pitchy to say yes to what you're saying. And um, if it's just a big old punch in the face with just like name after name after name after name of people that they know, like, and trust already, then you are, you get to share that know, like, and trust people. That's like the biggest principle. And there's so many people that don't get it. And there's so many people that don't use it. I just don't understand why it just makes total sense to me. It always has from the beginning. And it's been a concept that I've proven over time with my show, which is basically like continuing to get better and better and better quality guests on by continuing to get better and better quality guests on. That's how you do it. Like you keep getting better guests and then you keep getting better guests because you already have better guests. So like, it's just like the most difficult ones are the first like three to five. Once you get the first three to five, like you should be starting to roll through a lot of the people that you have on your list. Um, But that's why I always, I, I also segmented it right into like different networks. 
Um, and I tried to make sure that like, you know, the people that I was going after for a couple of months were all connected somehow. So it'd be easier for me to roll through those contacts, right? So if you're trying to reach out to, you know, if you're trying to reach out to the top real estate producer in the Western United States to be on your show. And then you're also trying to get, you know, a, a top affiliate marketer that lives in Bali and freelances affiliate deals. And you're trying to get both of them at the same time. They both probably operate in completely different worlds. Yeah. So they probably don't know each other and they probably don't share similar connections. Whereas if you go for that top real estate producer, just try to get more real estate producers or maybe maybe loan officers or or real estate investors or real estate influencers like go go after people that all seem to be interconnected and know each other and the best way to do that is to just listen to it that's that's why I'm such an avid consumer of content because it tells me who people are connected to so if you really want to get connected to somebody like tune into their show and start listening to all the people they're connected to and a lot of times the guests that come on their shows are a lot easier to get on your show than going straight to the person themselves. And then once you get enough of the people that that person recognizes, when you reach out, like they will have, they, like they will have a list of people that they already know, like, and trust that have been on your show and saying yes to you just seems like a no brainer because like you've taken all the guesswork out of the equation. They don't have to respond with uh, how many downloads do you have and how long have you been in iTunes and how many episodes have you put out? They don't have to ans ask any of those questions because you've already taken care of all of those by streamlining the process and just punch them in the face with credibility. Like you, you can't say no to me after that point. You know what I mean? Like if, if, yeah, for sure. if I already, if I already have, if I just listed 15 of your friends that you know, like trust and, and have done business with, like you don't got to go research me. You don't have to Google me. You don't have your, you don't have to have your assistant pull me up and see if it's worth your time. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to say yes. You know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I can say that that's actually been working for us too. Um, just because, so we're on like episode 50 this week and, uh, we only do it like one, one a week and we're finally starting to reach out to more and more influential people. Like we have you on the podcast now, we just had our pastor on our podcast. So it took us about a year, but it's, I can definitely see like our, our increase in our, like how good our guests are now. Sure. Yeah. It's a, the, see the path for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to, it's going to continue that way. As long as you guys continue to reach out to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, I kind of like, when you explain it, it almost sounds in my mind that you're collecting uh relational relationship based bread crumbs almost <laughs> like, yeah. you're, like you have a goal to maybe um, talk to this guy, but before you talk to him, you'll talk to like the four other people that he's had on his show or that he's affiliated with. And you know that, and that just seems to be a very, very efficient way to, to build that credibility. Cause I'm not going to lie. I reached out to a guy and I didn't even know how big he was. Honestly, it was crazy. Um, I reached out to a real estate guy, mm -hmm. I think a few months back. And then he asked me that very question of like, how many downloads <laughs> do you get a month? Yep. I don't know. I don't really care. At this point. <laughs> and um, he was like, come back to me when you hit like, I think he said 5,000 or something like that. And yeah, I'm, yeah. Dang. <laughs> and that was like my first rejection ever because before it was like, I was just interviewing anybody who sounded really, you know, amazing. And I think, sure. you know, I, I was able to bring a certain energy to people that made them, okay, like you seem like a pretty cool guy. I'll do it. Right, with right. You. Some yeah. people are like, I don't know who you are. I don't exactly. really care about you. Yeah. And then it's like, if the numbers don't line up, they, they which, don't want to be on. Sure. Which is totally fair. Yeah. You know, like, sure. like they got, they got time constraints. They have a yeah. lot of people requesting them all the time. So you got to yeah. give them the reason why you are going to be different than everybody else For and sure. why, why it's worth giving you some of their time rather than anybody else that's reaching out to them. Like you have to be you have to be the differentiator there. You know what I mean? Like that's the only way to get those people on is yeah. like, is, is understanding that like, they're not just being a dick. Like they just have a lot of demands on their time. Yeah, and definitely. They, they can't say yes to every opportunity or else they would do nothing but podcast interviews all day, every day. You yeah. Know? For sure. um, so like the, the, but like to prove the point, those people are going to be the best guests for your show because those are like, those are the needle movers. Those are the ones that have audiences. Yeah. Those are the ones that people recognize. Those are the ones that draw people into your show, into your RSS feed, into your website, draw traffic into your blog, your YouTube channel. Like those big names that pull that attention 
are are responsible for a lot of those things. And uh, so to get those people on is 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 a, a good goal um, just for the overall health and credibility authority of your show. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, you gotta you gotta really you gotta really make it make sense for them to give you their time rather than somebody else their time because that's ultimately all they're looking at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So then what, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So what is that, that follow-up like then um, when you do get rejected? Because like it will happen eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, crazy story. I'm not going to say her name because we don't have it totally a hundred percent scheduled yet, but I, uh, I have been working on this interview since October of 2017 um, I scrolled down in my inbox uh, when, when I got this email the other day to see how long ago I, I reached out. And uh, there's probably 35, 40 emails in that, in that chain of me checking in every two to three months. And they're, her assistant and her team giving me the runaround of like, oh, yeah. At the beginning, I'm sure it was just like, well, your show's nowhere near big enough. So they were just like, oh, yeah, maybe next time. You know what I mean? Like giving me the, give me the it's a no, but it's not really. Like I'm not going to tell you no, but it's a no answer. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so I, all I do every time is just ask if I can follow up in a couple of months. And unless they've expressly told me no, which I've only had a couple people ever do, um, then they're always like, yeah, sure. Fine. Yeah, go ahead. Like they don't care. They, they just, all that person's looking to do is get this, um, get this uh, request out of their inbox. <laughs> they're just trying to do their job. They're just trying to clear their inbox. Right. Yeah. So like, is if they, if they respond to you and then you respond with a, Hey, can I follow up? Like they don't care if you follow up. They just don't want to deal with it right now. They're just trying to get to inbox zero. You're just trying to take care of, do their job. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would always reach back out a couple months later and I always would put got put it on my calendar. Sure. Sure. Okay, great. Let me go put that on my calendar. I put it in three months later to reach back out, follow up, follow up, follow up. And then never come across with this like people have people are so freaking entitled these days, it blows my mind. And so yeah. people get entitled to feeling like you just des- like like I deserve an interview with you, and it's like no, you don't. Like that person, that person deserves to not have to do any interviews if they don't want to do it. Like sure, yeah. it's up to them. It's not up to you. Don't don't sit there and expect people to say yes, and don't get pissed off at people when they give you the runaround because they're super busy. Mm-hmm. And um, that's people's first tendency to do that. So anytime I would reach back out, it was always it was always like, hey, just following up, like I said I would, right? Because if you ask for permission to follow up, it never feels like you're being annoying because you're just being professional and doing what you said you were going to do. Absolutely. So, hey, just following up, like I said, I would. I uh, wanted to see if there's any way we can make this happen, and um, and then just kept getting pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. And then the last time that I followed up with her, um, her her assistant, like three weeks ago, I uh, had it in my calendar, so I followed up with her again, and she said something. Uh, that she said, she said something when she applied to my email, uh, her assistant, she was like, um, I was wondering when I was going to hear back from you. Um, it's, uh, it's, she was like, at this point, your persistence is like just straight up impressive. And she was like, and I mean that in a really positive way. She was like, I have a lot of respect for the fact that you continue to do this. And, um, you know, and obviously in that two and a half years since October of 17, my show has obviously made leaps and bounds. Oh yeah. And, and I've gotten, you know, 10 of her really close business friends and acquaintances on my show. So every time I would reach out with a follow-up, I would give them an update on that. Like, oh yeah, I just interviewed, you know, Dean Graziosi at his office, just had uh, this person on, that that person on, people that I knew that she was very familiar with and that she was friends with. And uh, so I kept throwing those in there too. So um, this last time, Persistent when she emailed me that back, I was like, ha, well, you know, I learned a long time ago through years of door-to-door sales and almost 400 podcast episodes that the ones that usually take the longest are often the most worth it. So I'm looking forward to getting this on the schedule in the next couple of months. And I'm sure it'll be one of my best episodes to date. And then that was all I said. And then like three days after that, she emailed me out of the blue, which is the first time she's ever reached out to me, this, this person's assistant. Mm. And she reached out to me out of the blue and was just like, hey, just wanted to give you an update. I officially got so-and-so to commit to doing an interview with you. Um, so as soon as we're done with this affiliate launch, um, we'll, we'll reach out and we'll get something scheduled. And so that was her reaching out to me because I basically had an advocate on the inside now, right? Like her assistant was on my team. Her assistant was like, man, I want to see this guy get an interview. He's been reaching right. out for longer. Than, like, like she literally switched assistants 
in between the time that I had reached out and now. So like wow. a year, year and a half ago, there's switched assistants on like, so I'd been reaching out for like a year longer than this girl's even been working for this girl. And, um, and, uh, so she was just like straight up down. She was just impressed that I kept like pushing and, and, and asking, but I was never pushy about it. I was never annoying about it. I never acted like I deserved it. I never got offended when they said no. I just kept following up and throwing it in, throwing it out there and saying, Hey, I would love to add value. I'd love to uh, share her story with my audience. I'd love to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. It was always about her and what I, how I could make it happen for her and, um, and how I can make it easy for her and all that kind of stuff, how I can make her look good. Everything was always about her. And so this last time she reached out and was just like, yep, she's officially committed. I talked to her about it on purpose today and she's officially committed. I just wanted to let you know so that you can, you know, like feel good about yourself or rest up or whatever she said. And then she was like, I'll, I'll contact you after this big affiliate push that we're doing and uh, we'll set something up. And so that was, I mean, that's one example of, of persistence. And that'll probably be my flagship story from now on because it's just... It's just, it was a long time coming. Uh, but just like that story, I have several other ones that are very similar that were like a year in that time frame, like reaching out to somebody for a year, reaching out to somebody for six months, eight months, seven months. Like, you know, that there's just a lot of, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And it really just depends on your priorities. Like, do you really want that person that much? Because some people say, oh yeah, reach out in a couple months. And I'm like, eh not worth it. Like, eh, no, I don't really care. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really care if you come on. Like, I'm not that big. Of, like, I'm not that huge of a fan of yours. You know? <laughs> You're right. Sure, but like, yeah, exactly. I was just like, yeah, not worth my time to continually reach out and push for this one. You know, I don't really care. But for some of them, it very much is worth my time. And it's yeah. very much uh, worth it for me, uh, whether it's because that person's super influential and could do a lot for my show and my audience, or it's just because I have a ton of respect for them and I want to talk to them that much. Like some people just res like their story resonates with me so much that I just want to have a conversation with them and get to know them so bad that I'm willing to like, you know, be put off for a couple years or more. Um, and, um, and wait until it's the right timing for them too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to uh, see who I, it is. I was going to let, I was going to say, I'll let you know, I'll let you know if and when it gets scheduled. For awesome. sure. I, I'm, I'm going to guess it, but I'm not going to guess it on the show. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> but I'll tell you who I think it is, though. Okay. Um, so in your opinion, I, I mean, we've been talking a lot about networking, building relationships, um, which is really, I feel like, the backbone of having a podcast. In your opinion, um, I feel like, obviously, in the past, there's been a lot of negative connotation to the word networking. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, is there a difference between networking and relationship building or are they one in the same to you? Like how, what is your thought process around that? Yeah, it's a good question, man. And it's something that I talk about pretty frequently. So if you've listened to my content, you probably already know the answer, but uh, it's one activity. Uh, the, the, the reason that networking gets a bad rap is because people treat it like two separate activities. And the way that most people treat networking is that 1980s style of networking that's very much a like in-person cold calling opportunity. Like they use it very much as like, a, I need to go around, shake as many hands as I possibly can, hand out as many business cards as I possibly can, and, and, and then book some business tonight. And it's just like, that's not what networking's for. Like networking is not for that. Like go door to door, like get a, get a list of numbers and cold call. Like I think cold calling has its place. You're talking to a door to door sales guy, but networking is not the place for it. And that's what gives it such a bad reputation is people have, people have that sleazy, slimy, smarmy salesperson feel whenever they walk into a networking situation and put their name tag on that uh, makes them go, well, I'm never doing that again. You get that anxious anxiety yeah. feeling. You got to go get a drink just to be able to walk around and like have your nerves be down because you're so so nervous that you're not going to book any business and that people aren't going to like you. And it's just this really crappy version of what it really is supposed to be, which ultimately is just relationship building. Like networking should be way easier because all you're doing is building relationships with people that you know share a common interest with you. That's way easier than doing it at like a bar or a club or something like that where like like people treat it differently where it's like, you know, well, I'm out, I'm at the bar with my friends. That's different than going to a networking event. And it's like, no, it's not different. Like it's the same thing. You're just furthering relationships with other people in your life at the bar, just like you would be doing at the networking event. So when you start treating them like they're the same thing, it actually becomes a lot easier because if I, if I go to a podcast event and I'm walking around in the mixer that night with a cocktail in my hand, like I know that I have something in common with every single person in that room. 
I'm already starting with a leg up than I would be like if I was at a bar playing yeah. darts or whatever. Like, I don't know if that person is like an employee nine to five or thinks everything I would do would just be hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, but in that situation, I know that we share something, we share a common interest at least. There's something that we can we have a commonality on, we can find a common ground on. And and that's really all relationship building is, in my opinion, man, it's just like meeting people from different backgrounds, different contexts, different perspectives, different um, uh, cultures, different, different skin colors, different everything. And being able to find what we do agree on and being able to find that common ground, the ability to connect with somebody, the ability to actually share a human experience with another human being, like that's really what it's about. And, and uh, so, it, so yeah, people, people treat them like they're two separate activities and they're just not, it's just, there's relationship building and then there's relationship building. And if you're doing the networking thing, then you're probably doing it wrong. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So everybody that's listening, you can just calm down. Right. Relax. Yeah, exactly. So Um, I'll go ahead. So we want to start wrapping it up to respect your time. Uh, What is the number one takeaway that you'd like someone to walk away from this episode with? Yeah, if you're looking to become a better networker um, and you want to move your networking from 1983 to 2020, um, then uh, I highly suggest starting a podcast just like Joseph and Jasmine have done. Um, It it was the number one thing that I did for my network and I know it's going to help your network too. So uh, if you, if you're listening to this and you've never considered even starting a podcast, like you don't know what that would look like, just start thinking about it. Give it, give it some thought because it's easily the number one thing that's exploded my network over the last couple of years um, and enabled me to do what I do now on a daily basis, which is something that I thoroughly enjoy and have a blast doing. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I would highly encourage looking into starting a podcast. If you're like a six or seven figure entrepreneur and you're really busy already and you have your business that's bringing in revenue on the back end and you don't have the time to learn all the tech stuff and learn how to start it and media and distribution and all that stuff, then just head over to travischapelcom slash make my podcast and my team will make a podcast for you. Wow. That's legit. That is. Yeah. <laughs> So we definitely eventually need to have a part two one day so that you could talk more about that. This, and some it's of just so much things. we can talk to you Oh, about. yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I could talk for hours, but that wouldn't be good for either one of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, there's definitely going to have to be a part two in the works one day. But uh, you come, you came onto the Abundant Culture podcast, and we feel the need to ask this to everybody that comes on because we always get extremely interesting answers and that question is whether it be in your business or even in your personal life how do you choose to spread abundance in the areas where you're abundant oh that's a good question i I would have to say through my podcast and uh my facebook group and my youtube channel and the other things that i do because that's all that's that's all we're about is abundance and and that's really that's really the almost one of the foundational pieces of networking and connecting with people is an attitude of abundance. Because if you are, if you're networking the old way, you automatically have a scarcity mindset. You believe that there's a limited business and that's why you're never willing to like share your secrets. You're never willing to collaborate with other people because you're always afraid people are going to take what you're doing and they're going to implement it and then they're going to steal your clients. Like there's this big feeling of scarcity to, the scarcity that comes along with that. And so with the whole message that we try to push is that it comes with an abundance mentality, like the ability to jump on a podcast and share a bunch of information to a bunch of your audience that like your, and I'm not saying this in a mean way. I'm just saying like facts, right? Like your audience doesn't directly benefit me right now. You know, like right. this hour that we've spent talking together, like I don't get paid for this. This isn't something that, uh, that uh, you know, I get to write off. Like there's no real benefit to me except for spreading abundance for and, sure. and being able to share of the things that I've learned completely for free um, with a couple of awesome hosts to an audience that I'm sure will benefit from it. Like just that is an abundance mentality and not wanting to hold all these secrets in for me and myself and only the people that pay me ever learn anything that I do. Like that's just, that's just the opposite of, of what we're trying to create here. And so we want abundance and we want, we, we do want that abundance culture and we want that, um, uh, we want to eliminate the, the scarcity mentality uh, by, by doing more stuff like this and, and move into more of that collaborative space. So I appreciate you guys. I love it. Thank you. We appreciate Absolutely you too. Love it. <laughs> so, if somebody wants to uh, work with you, either on a podcast 
or they want to interview you because you're an awesome guest to have on a podcast episode, uh, where would be the best place for them to actually get into contact with you? Travischapel.com basically has everything that I do. Uh, C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L, uh, Travischapel.com, uh, all my social links. Uh, uh, YouTube is Travischapel.com slash YouTube. Um, the podcast is Travischapel.com slash show. So pre- pretty much everything's over over there. Um, and then if you are serious um, and uh, and you do make, you got to be making some decent money right now if you want me to make a podcast for you because it's not cheap, mm-hmm. uh, but I, it will be quality and you, it will attract ideal clients into your business, which will pay for itself very quickly. So if you do want something like that, you're interested in at least having a conversation about it. There's no commitment. There's no um, expectations, no risk. If you go over to travischapel.com slash make my podcast, um, there's just a quick application there and we'll hop on a phone call and see if it'll be a good fit. Cause I don't work with people that I don't think will be able to make the money back within a certain time period. So um, I only work with people that I'm very confident in. So um, yeah, the application process is there for you, but it's also there for me because I want to make sure that it's a good fit for both of us. So travschapel.com slash make my podcast. Awesome. awesome. And everyone listening, you have to have to join his Facebook group. Um, I think that's actually where we first started talking, uh, Travis. So I'm sure that's probably how I even got your attention in the first place. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's a great place to connect with me. I'm pretty active over there. Yes, you are. So that's like a great group. Um, the people in the group are also great too. I've talked to a couple of them. So awesome. definitely join the group. <laughs> yeah, cool. And that's at uh, TravisChapel.com slash group. So. Cool. Awesome. Yep. So thank you again, Travis, for coming onto the podcast. You were a wealth of knowledge and I'm sure everyone listening will definitely enjoy this show. Well, thanks for having me, Jasmine. Thanks, Joseph. Appreciate you guys. No problem. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.